Good morning, and welcome to our, our service here in Glendermott today. This is two sacraments we're having today, one of baptism and one of the Lord's Supper, so uh, it's great to have the two sacraments together. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we bid you a special welcome, and again, those who are listening by means of YouTube, DVD, or uh, CD ministry, it's uh, great to have you, have you joining with us. Tonight we're going to have a short service of uh, Thanksgiving, uh, 6.30 tonight we're going to have a short service of Thanksgiving and then we're going to have a service of communion for those who maybe couldn't get out this morning or would prefer to come out at night when there's less about, uh, that, that's great. In these times of, of uh, still a bit of COVID about yet, uh, we can understand that there's some people who would maybe not want to come into a large gathering but would join us tonight uh, when there's less people. Hope there's not less people. Hope everybody's back out again. It'd be great to see every face back back tonight again. But that's uh, that's where we're at. Uh, we'd like to welcome David and Sarah. It feels a bit strange welcoming David and Sarah. But welcome David and Sarah and Catherine and little Emily for baptism today. And uh, it, it's great to have you here. There's a Kirk session meeting on Tuesday the 10th at 7:30 p.m. There is some items over there of our food rescue from Olio over in the hall. So again, feel free to, to pick one or two or three or four items up, whatever you, whatever you can use, and get it used up so that there's no waste. The small group Bible study meets again on Wednesday night. And again, we're staying in our small groups this week to continue the, the, the Daniel story. So it's, it's great. Some of you may have got these already, but the account books are available in the vestibules. If you didn't get one, you can get, there's ones on both of these side vestibules as well, so you can get one on the way out or take one to, to somebody who you feel would, would benefit from having it. And again, thanks to, to David Campbell and all those who, who, who have been so dedicated in getting the information to him and getting it into the book. So again, it's great. The pound jar and the scrap jar, again, were counted at the end of last week. And in April, the pound jar had 415 pounds in it which ticks up to a grand total of £10,523.90 to our building fund. And in April, the scrap jar accumulated £53, so it ticks it up to £2,703.10. There will be no pastoral drop-in this week uh, on Tuesday. Stephen has a, another appointment, but on Thursday, again, we're, we're, he's going to continue on it as normal. No choir practice this week, but choir practice will commence again next week at, on Tuesday at 6.30. There's no coffee morning next Saturday, which has been our tradition of doing a bit of a coffee morning on the first Saturday of every month. But what we're intending to do, and there's a reason why there was no coffee morning, because the PW have an event in Belfast, which is going to correspond with that. But it gives us an opportunity to support our colleagues in, in Exodus, because we're having a free fry well, we've, we've, we've labelled it as a free fry. Uh, we've been gathering up some of these oleo items and putting them in the freezer, and we have now enough that we can, we can host a, a fry on Saturday the 14th at a half past 10 in the morning. Now, I told you it'll be free. It'll be free while you're eating it, but on the way out, we would like you to put a donation in a plate for Exodus. We have one of our, our people who have joined us recently, um, Amy Cole, and so we might know Amy. Amy has come along to us and has been worshipping with us, and she's out today with her boyfriend. And it's great that she is going to Hungary in the month of July. So we want to try and encourage Amy and make sure that we uh, we can put some money towards those disadvantaged areas of the world where where God's word still needs to be spoken. And again, a big thanks to all those who come along for the kitchen cleanup last week. Uh, it's, it's great to see the kitchens looking so clean, uh, and it's also, we'll put a, Stephen's put a wee note there, keep it this way please. <laughs> so, I don't know whether it was him or Valerie put that on, but I know it's there. On to the PW then, those who are going to PW annual conference on the Saturday the 7th, uh, the, the bus leaves uh, at a half past, is that 10, 8, 10, Stephen? <coughs> eight, 10 past 8, so meet at 8 o'clock at Drumahoe Park and Ride. And then the PW outing is on Saturday the 21st of May between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. going to Oak Gardens in the afternoon and tea is supplied by Woodbank House in Garva and the cost is 20, 20 pounds per person. Money's to Olivia as soon as possible and all ladies are welcome to that even if you've never been to PW. If you'd like to come along and experience that, they'd be delighted to have you along. So there's that announcement for that, that announcement you'll hear it again anyway. 
And just an announcement about our communion. We're trying to normalise things again. You'll see the elements are here as they've always been in previous years. So the main body of the church is where we're going to serve the communion. So those who have sat themselves in the gallery, just before communion, Stephen will give you an opportunity to come downstairs, pick a seat down here. There's a few at the front here, and there's a few in the side aisles as well. There's not that many in the gallery, so if you just come down to the main body of the church, we'll serve the communion to you as elders. Okay, thank you. Expenses were there. We are trying to save on the batteries, you know. <laughs> Every penny counts, isn't that what they say? Good morning. <laughs> now you can hear me. Good morning. It's good uh, to be uh, here. It's good to be to with you in, in worship. It's good to join as always together as God's people uh, to worship Him. And as George says, it's good uh, to be here and to celebrate both uh, our sacraments together. You know us. Uh, as a Reformed tradition, we only hold uh, to two sacraments, and it's wonderful uh, to celebrate the two of them together. So, David and Sarah, and of course, family. As George says, it's a bit odd for him welcoming his own family here, so I'll welcome you as well. It's good to have you all uh, with us uh, for this important day uh, today. As we come uh, to worship, I just want to read uh, a few verses from First Timothy uh, to lead us into our, our first uh, hymn together. Um, wonderful words, uh, words I'm sure many of us uh, know and uh, hold close uh, to our hearts and worth thinking about on today, today of all days uh, as we meet, I uh, say, the two sacraments, both pointing us uh, to Jesus. And in Paul's letter to, uh, to Timothy in, in chapter 1, verse 15, he says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. With that thought ringing, in our, our minds and in our hearts, uh, we're going to stand, we're going to sing uh, to God's praise uh, together, our first hymn um, together, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Kyle Tester down the back today, Al. <laughs> the wee gremlins are moving about today. Um, it happens, doesn't it? It happens. Listen, let's, let's come to God in prayer together. Let's, let's commit our time of worship to him. Let's, let's pray. And Father, it is good for us, as we always would recognize, to come together and to gather as your people to, to meet and to worship you. And as we come together today, of, of all days, as we gaze at your table spread before us, inviting us to join with you to celebrate a special family meal together. Awe oh, and wonder. I really don't even begin to cover how we feel. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Amazing love. How can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Thank you. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace to us. Because we know that without that amazing grace to us, that grace that sent your Son to give us life in our place. We wouldn't even be remotely worthy to come to worship you. Never mind come and fellowship with you around your table today. And yet, Father, as easily as we say we stand in awe of what you've done for us, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we don't reflect that in our day-to-day -day lives. So often ignore you and what you say to each of us through your word and by your spirit. So often our lives portray a, a greater love for ourselves than they do for you. And so we simply pray today that as we meet to worship and especially as we gather around your table later and as we enjoy the sacrament of baptism together, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us that you would convict each and every one of our hearts to turn to you in genuine repentance and know the joy of your forgiveness. To know that special grace upon grace that you've promised us in your word. And so our Father, as we gather in this meeting house here today, as we lift our hearts and our voices in praise to you, as we listen for you speaking to us through your word, will you meet with us? Will you bless us as we seek to bless your holy name and to lift high the wonderful name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus himself? For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do things in a slightly different order uh, today. We are going to turn to our, our sacrament of, of baptism uh, together now. And as I make my way down uh, to the front, uh, we're going to stand and we're going to sing the first two verses of our baptismal hymn. Today we go back to our, our more traditional uh, baptismal hymn, Our Children, Lord, in faith and prayer. We bring before your face. Let's stand and let's worship God together. <laughs> Congregation, please uh, take a seat for a moment or two. 
It is uh, wonderful, uh, as we've said. It's, it's wonderful just to, to be able to come and to, uh, to, to celebrate this sacrament of baptism together. But it is, I suppose, kind of special for me today. It's good to be back celebrating this sacrament with uh, you, David and Sarah, and of course, Catherine, uh, again today. Um, I say it's wonderful for a number of reasons. Firstly, because, uh, believe it or not, if you remember, Catherine was the first baby I baptized uh, when I came to, to Glendermott. And you haven't forgiven me for it since. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so it's great uh, to be able to celebrate that sacrament with them as, as a family. Again. Then, of course, uh, it is uh, wonderful uh, because of the, this is a really significant day uh, in their family's life, but it's a significant day for us uh, in this fellowship uh, as well. As has already been intimated, we have only two sacraments in the Reformed faith. Uh, and it's always a joy to celebrate either of them. Uh, but of course, today, uh, it's wonderful to celebrate the two together as they both point us uh, to our union with God uh, through Jesus. We will join, uh, as you know, around the Lord's table later in our service, which naturally is that visible reminder of Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross for our sin. And of course, uh, the forgiveness of our sins for our disobedience to God. It's a reminder and celebration for those of us who believe uh, that we've been freed from the burden of sin and know the assurance of eternal life. Uh, and as I've said before, uh, even talking about these things and, and thinking about what Christ has done for us should, should bring joy uh, to our hearts. Uh, but first, of course, as we say, we join to celebrate with David and Sarah as they bring Emily before God uh, and to the church here. Uh, to make their vows and promises in this amazing sacrament of baptism. And of course, this too, as we say, should bring joy to our hearts. Yes, because a new child is a blessing from God, which obviously brings joy to our hearts. And joy as well, because as Christian parents, uh, David and Sarah, have this deep desire to bring uh, their child into the fellowship of Christ's visible church, uh, where we do, uh, as always, trust and pray that in God's time uh, they will come to know Jesus and confess him as their own Saviour and Lord. But there is uh, another joy uh, as well, because baptism and the Lord's Supper are linked. Our Westminster Confession describes baptism as a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, as a sign and a seal of the covenant of grace, of regeneration and remission of sins. I reread a little booklet recently from the Gospel Coalition on baptism and the Lord's Supper. And in the section on baptism, there was a great little line when they were talking about the sign and sacrament of baptism. And it's what I've been getting at about both pointing us to Jesus. And it said this, it says, baptism is like a neon light flashing. Gospel, gospel, gospel. When the church practices baptism, it says she testifies to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And surely anything which screams gospel, 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 uh, should bring joy to our hearts as well uh, as we think about the significance of what we're about uh, to celebrate. Baptism is a highly significant sacrament for Christian parents and the church alike because it is so central to this demonstration of God's love and grace to us uh, as sinners. And of course, baptism is that sign of promised salvation through faith in Jesus. It is a joy, but as we all know all too well, uh, there is an, an, an immense responsibility involved in it as well. On the parents, as they bring their child forward to consider their vows and promises uh, as they make them, but on us too uh, as well, uh, you will know we all stand uh, together and we all make a commitment uh, to God uh, as well. So you'll know where I'm going. I'm going to read uh, the short declaration that I always do to remind us all of what we are about uh, to undertake in this sacrament. It's that little reminder about God's blessing uh, being on those who take their vows with honesty and sincerity, but also the outcome of those who make promises lightly and neglect to fulfill the, the vows that they've made. 
So firstly, and primarily to you, David and Sarah, but to us all as a congregation, um, I solemnly charge you now in the presence of God and of this congregation that in answering these questions, you do so with honesty and sincerity. For be assured that the blessing of God only rests upon those who so promise and then fulfill, whereas the wrath of God is the portion of those who promise lightly or thoughtlessly and neglect to fulfill their solemn obligations to him. So, in light of that, will we all stand, please? Can I ask you all to stand uh, as we stand in unity with David uh, and Sarah and each other uh, as we come to this sacrament? So firstly, to you, David, and to Sarah. We'll try and get this over and done with before, he, before she wakes up. She might wake up in a wee minute or two. Um, but uh, to your vows, first and foremost, in presenting this child for baptism, are you affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as Lord of your life? And depending on the grace of God, are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? And are you willing to provide a Christian home and bring up your child in the worship and teaching of this church so that she may come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord? And to you, the congregation, as we receive Emily into the fellowship of this church, do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for her and for her family? Now the good bat. Mm -hmm. Stay sleeping. Stay sleeping. <laughs> You're not for moving. That's good. That's what I like to see. See if I can manoeuvre about here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Put her back to sleep again. <laughs> Emily, Joanna Chambers, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good girl, good girl. This child is now received according to Christ's command and to the membership of the Holy, Universal, and Apostolic Church and is engaged to be the Lord's. Let's sing the ironic blessing together. Father, we thank you for the wonder of this sacrament. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the, the love you have for us and for our children. And Lord, we thank you that you have accepted Emily into your visible church here in Glendermott this morning through this wonderful sacrament of baptism. Lord, we pray that you would be with her as she grows up. Lord, will you make her strong in body and in mind. Lord, will you help both her parents, David and Sarah, as they seek to bring her up in that Christian home. Lord, we do pray that in your time and in your will, she will come to know Jesus as her own Savior and Lord. Lord, as always, we pray for all the families of this congregation. Lord, we pray that you would be known in all of our homes, that you would be worshipped, that you would be celebrated in each and every one of our homes. Lord, would you bless us all as your people here, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We're going to sing uh, the closing two verses of uh, our baptismal hymn, and if it's okay with David and Sarah, I'm going to go back to our old tradition, and Emily Mee's going to go for a wee walk. Do you trust me? <laughs> That's not very convincing. <laughs> Let's sing uh, the last two verses of, of our hymn. Yeah, you agree. <laughs> It's that long since I've done this, I'm a wee bit slow. She's out for the count anyway. I think it's good uh, to do the likes of this, to attend her juicer. We have accepted her into this fellowship, so it's good to be able to do this uh, wee walk uh, as we used to do. I normally say, say hello to everybody, but she's, she's zonked out here, so we'll get you back to your mama before you wake up, will we? Uh, You think I'm going to steal her, Catherine? Will I take her home with me? No, no, wouldn't do that. Take her to your own house. I will indeed. And as, as always, we talk about bringing our children up uh, in the teaching and the ways of the church and of God's word. And that's her first little Bible and her certificate of, of baptism. I give them to you, David. Thank you. Want to just take a seat uh, a wee moment, please? Right, where are we at? If there are any children who want to go out at uh, the children's church uh, at this point, um, they can do. I'm going to turn to God's Word. Uh, we're going to read... Uh, our portion of scripture for today and, and while I prepare to do that if the young folk want to head out at the children's church you can uh, do that now and I'm going to get my coat off because it's boiling up here As the children leave, if you want to, to open your Bibles, if you want to use one of the, the pew Bibles, they are there for, for your use. Uh, if you want to turn to, to page 892 uh, of the pew Bible, it should be coming up on the screen uh, as well. Um, I suppose and not say I should apologize, that's not an apology, but um, we had talked about initially uh, as we were studying through Daniel that we would study Daniel 1 to 6 here on Sunday mornings and we would continue uh, through into the apocalyptic um, literature uh, in our midweeks and so on, but um, not something I do very often, um, but uh, later on in the week uh, I changed my mind. I had a sermon prepared for today uh, specifically relating to, to communion, but uh, I felt a strong urge led by the Spirit of God to, to change uh, my sermon, and so I, deci I decided I wanted to preach on, on Daniel uh, chapter 7, but we'll just read uh, the first uh, 14 verses. Uh, the first 14 verses give us an image of Daniel's dream, uh, and then we move on into the interpretation. Uh, but it's good for us just to, to read uh, the actual dream uh, itself. So it's on page 892 of the Pew Bible, if you're following 
uh, and on, on the screens then uh, as well. So let's read uh, God's word uh, together. Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 1. Daniel's dream of four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. And Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear, it was raised up on one of its sides, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one which came out among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. The river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And this kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. We end our reading there at verse 14. And do trust as we look at that together now that God will uh, speak to us uh, through it. Let me see if I can get my slides up here. Not wanting to put you under pressure down the back, Aaron, but... (laughs) Brilliant, thank you. Um, Apologies and no apologies. Um, I've always said that a pulpit uh, is no place for politics. And I still hold to that same conviction today. But as a province, as we stand on the cusp of another election here, and probably most of you, uh, like me, have maybe watched with, with some interest or maybe some disinterest at some of the antics that go on up on the hill. We don't know what to think or to say. We've maybe even got to the point of thinking to ourselves, what's the point anyway? Why are we even voting? Things are just getting worse and worse. Nothing seems to change. Nothing seems to get better. As we look out at laws, some of the laws that are being passed and trying to be passed both here and in Westminster, which clearly go against the teaching of Scripture. And if, not to sound too dramatic, some which are a complete outright offence to God, we wonder, don't we, what's going on? 
concerns we have around things like abortion, same-sex issues, conversion therapy laws, if you've come across them so far. They're being slipped in under the door as well. Laws which could affect and will even affect outlaw God's people like ourselves praying with someone seem to have been slipped to the bottom of the pile because they don't command the popular vote. And there's no doubt there are times uh, like these when we might feel uh, like the psalmist and, and cry out in a sense of, of hopelessness uh, to God. I know I quite often quote Psalm 77 uh, that has that same sense of, of doom and gloom. Let me read you some of the verses. This is how the psalmist felt. He says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out on tiring hands. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O oh God. And I groaned, I mused, and my spirit grew faint. My heart mused and my spirit inquired, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show us favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Do you ever feel like that? Despair, frustration, and yes, sometimes downright despondency might just sum up how we feel sometimes. Never mind our own wee country here. As we as Christians look out at our world and the, the downward spiral that it seems to be taking these days, do you ever wonder when it's all going to end? Is God ever going to come and sort the whole problem out? Do we feel like the psalmist and think, has God forgotten about us altogether? We'll enter Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel's first dream about these beasts rising up out of the sea and everything we read there. I know there are times when we think about the likes of these apocalyptic dreams in the Bible. We read stories uh, of these weird beasts rising up out of the sea in the likes of Daniel or in Revelation where we see all kinds of, of visions like fire-breathing horses with heads like lions and so on. And we think to ourselves, that's far too hard to understand. And I'm forgetting to click this on forward. It's far, too far, too hard to understand. And we close the book. Maybe it doesn't seem relevant to us in these days. So we just stop reading. And, and I suppose I, I, I would want to say, it's kind of weird in a way, isn't it? That we're not interested in this kind of thing. You look at the obsession out there in the world and in Hollywood with, with all those sorts of things. So many different films out there focused on, on floods, pandemics, mutant creatures, zombies, aliens threatening the world. Trying to, to understand what the end of the world is going to look like. And yet here, God gives us a vision and tells us exactly what it's going to be like. And we close the book. We watch, well I'm going to say it, all this garbage on TV. Trying to work out what the world is going to be like in the future. And God gives it to us here. And we close the book. But if we get our minds past all the weird creatures that Daniel tells us here are, are terrifying and frightening and very powerful. And if we focus on the simple message that God is trying to get through to us, then this dream really has something very important to say to us, especially in these days. As I was reading a book on this very chapter uh, the other week, I think the writer puts it well when he says this. 
if we understand the central purpose of these passages and focus our attention on what is clear and straightforward rather than on what is complicated and obscure, then we will find blessing and encouragement. And as a bit of a side, the title to the chapter that said that is called The Triumph of the Son of Man. So that may give you a bit of a hint of where I'm going with this. So, in this crazy, crazy world, this world that seems to be spiraling out of control as we watch our society and laws become more and more hedonistic and ungodly, here's Stephen's hopefully simplified take on Daniel's first dream. And I'm going to break it into two obvious sections. You might have picked them up on the screen already. You know that old saying, there's good news and there's bad news? There's your two sections. The good news and the bad news. And I'm going to give you the bad news first. It's always good to give the bad news and then we build you up with the good news, isn't it? The bad news of Daniel's dream. Dream starts off in... The sense of absolute turmoil. The four winds, he says, of heaven are churning up the sea. Picture it in your mind for a minute. Hurricane or or storm, whatever name you want to give it to in these days. Sadly, I did look it up. The next storm that hits our, our country will be called Gladys. Isn't that a lovely name? So picture it in your mind. Storm Gladys has arrived. And the waves are chopping, the seas are swirling, this mighty tsunami is brewing, and, and out of the turmoil comes these evil, terrifying beasts with bodies of lions and bears and leopards, with wings like eagles, eyes all over the place. And the top of it all, they've got horns, lots of horns, and even a small horn that has eyes and speaks. A dream? So I think about that and look at that. That's not a dream, that's a nightmare. So what are we to make of these beasts? Well, the simplified version, they're exactly the same uh, as the statue that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt about that we looked at uh, before. Statue made of gold, silver, bronze, iron and clay. Symbolized all the different nations and powers of the world that would rise and fall throughout history. And this is simply the same. Each beast represents a nation in history that would rise up only to be brought down by the next one and then the next one and the next one and so on until God's kingdom comes and crushes them all. It's the same. In both dreams, whether it's the statue or whether it's the beast, we have the same message. Different nations getting more and more powerful each time. Until we get to what most would contend, uh, who is the last and most powerful beast, Rome. Rome comes along and strips the power and authority from all the rest of the nations. The bad news here gets even worse. If you didn't think that the world in turmoil like this was bad enough, it gets even worse. Especially if we think about who this message is for. All the other dreams we've looked at before were given to the, the worldly, the, the ungodly leaders uh, in the world to remind them that all their power, all their pomp and all their ceremony and all their authority could be taken away from them in a flash. In the will and the time of God, all their sense of self-importance could be and would be crushed by God. But not this dream. This dream's different. This dream's given directly to Daniel, one of God's people. God's man representing God's people. So the reality is that this terrifying message of turmoil and oppression is for God's people. This terrifying message is for us. In a way, 
like I put it to some folk on Wednesday evening, Daniel's wee bubble had burst when he hears what this dream means. If you read on through the interpretation on it, which I encourage you to do later on, Daniel says he, he turned pale. He was sick to his stomach. Up to now, things had been bad for him. He was in captivity in Babylon. But it was okay anyway. God had said in his word through Jeremiah that they'd only be in captivity for 70 years. That's not too bad. But now he's been told that after Babylon, another evil beast coming to oppress them. Then another, then another, then another. You get the picture? Daniel thought that the world was going to get better for God's people. And now God says, well, no, actually. It's going to get even worse. His bubble had burst. That's the bad news. Aren't you glad I chose to speak on this today? As you sit and listen to, to Daniel's dream and my simplified version of it, aren't you glad I spoke on it? And can you identify? Can you identify with Daniel at all? As we look out at our world and the state of our world today, had you hoped it was going to get better? Had you hoped your life was going to get better or easier? Had you hoped that God would intervene and sort the whole mess out? It's more and more of our political and world leaders turn to, to liberalism and socialism and leave the word of God in the cupboard or at the door. They don't allow it to impact their lives or anyone else's. What hope is there for our world? Well, here's the good news. God has intervened. As the arrogant and boastful beast struts around the place, we're told the Ancient of Days comes out and takes his place on the judgment seat. And we see a very different image, don't we? Clothes as white as snow, hair as white as wool, and the purifying fire of heaven flowing past. And 10,000 10 times 10,000 people bowing down before him and, and worshiping. God appears in the midst of all the turmoil, of all the trouble and all these terrifying dreams and so on. God appears. The book is opened. And judgment is passed. The final beast, the worst of them all, is slain. And his body is destroyed and thrown into the fire. And as that happens, the Son of Man appears. Jesus appears, coming out of the clouds to be at his Father's side. And it's he, it's Jesus, not the beast, who's given all the authority, the glory and the sovereign power over all peoples, all nations, and men of every language. God wins. That's the simple message to help us carry on in our crazy and difficult world. That's the simple message that will get us through in this crazy and difficult world. Out of all the confusion of visions and dreams, out of everything we've seen with all the evil and terrifying monsters, God wins. God comes and judges evil. And he rules his kingdom. The kingdom that we're told is the everlasting kingdom. Kingdom that will not pass away or ever be destroyed. The message for us all in Daniel 7 is that this human Christ, as the world would see him, and for us, the Son of Man who died on the cross, isn't the end of the story. Yes, for now, we live in a day of monstrous beasts ruling the world. There's no doubt about that. 
And yes, at the minute, they have authority to rule in this world. And yes, they have the authority to kill. And yes, in some cases, they have the authority to triumph over and subdue God's people. At the minute. And yes, some of those ungodly beasts do kill and persecute God's faithful people. Places like China, Afghanistan, and so on. We all know that. Some of these ungodly beasts there are the terrorists who fly into buildings and blow up innocent people. They're the ones who bring about much of the brokenness in our world today. And it's these ungodly beasts who bring about poverty, slavery, hunger, and war, and so on. The world, in its ungodliness, will try and blame God. But Scripture says, it is these ungodly beasts who bring this about. They are the ones who set God's word aside. Set God's standards aside just to go with the flow for the popular vote for their own ends. Oh, they'll, they'll tell you otherwise. But then the evil one, the great deceiver, is the one who's working away in the background. There's no doubt in these days, we live in a world of terrifying beasts. But the promise, the promise in God's word is that we won't live in their world forever. There will come a day when all wrongs will be set right. There will come a day when all hunger will come to an end. There will come a day <clears throat> when all sickness will be cured and every sorrowing heart will be comforted. There will come a day when all persecution will stop. There will come a day when God, the Ancient of Days, will sit on his throne and open the book of judgment on every single person on this earth. Absolutely. There will be a day when the great beast when Satan himself and all who follow him will be brought before the throne to answer for their crimes and thrown into the lake of fire forever. And we know this because of what we celebrate here today. Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, came to this earth and walked that lonely walk to the cross and died that excruciating death that God and man can be reconciled forever. Forever. His dominion will never end, it says here. Forever in the eternity. Jesus died and rose that even the greatest weapon in the devil's armory, the one we fear the most, death itself, has been defeated. As we celebrate today, let's really celebrate in our hearts. Let's remember the, the simple message. As we read God's word, let's see the simple message. God wins. There's no doubt this world is an ugly, messy place. God so loved that world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will never die but have everlasting life. All of scripture, friends, and this piece of weird and wonderful scripture, this weird and wonderful dream points us to Jesus. The Son of Man coming in the clouds to gather his people together to end all the wrongs in this world. And what a day that will be. I'm almost tempted to break in the song, but I haven't pre warned Mark. He wouldn't let me sing anyway. If you remember a song we've sang a number of times before, 
Let me read you some of the words. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains, that my God is the Ancient of Days. Though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, he is here with me, I am not alone. Oh, his love is sure, and he knows my name. For my God is the Ancient of Days. And though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the Ancient of Days. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the Ancient of Days. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. Lord, we often recognize how your word challenges us. And Father, yes, it is a challenge as we read words like this that remind us of the state of the world that we live in. But Father, what an encouragement at the end. That mighty vision of you, our Father, the Ancient of Days, sitting on that throne. And Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, coming in the clouds to be at your side. Lord, we long for that day when we will meet you face to face. But until that time, as we live on in this, this messy world that we do live in, where sin and oppression are so prevalent, Lord, help us to take encouragement from your word to us. That one day in your time and your will, Lord, that will all end, that your kingdom will come into being fully. Lord, we will be gathered up to be with you. Lord, what, what a joy and what an encouragement that is to us. Or to know that, or whether we have gone before or whether we are still here when that day happens, we will be gathered up to be with you. What an amazing truth. Father, we thank you once again for the truth of the sacrament that we celebrate together now. Lord, that Jesus, yes, died, but rose again, glorious from the grave to pay for all of that wonderful truth. So help us to keep our eyes focused heavenward or in the midst of all that we do, we may look to you. So Lord, be with us. Bless us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to turn to our celebration of the Lord's Supper together now. And as we prepare to do that, we're going to stand and we're going to sing the first verses of our communion hymn. Here, O my Lord, I see you face to face. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Congregation, please uh, take a seat. If anyone in the galleries uh, would want to come down uh, and celebrate with us, uh, now is the, the time uh, to, to make that move. If you want to just make your way down uh, as I introduce uh, the supper, that, that would be good now. So. As we come uh, to the table today, uh, we welcome uh, for the first time uh, around this table as communicant members of Glendermott uh, on transfer uh, from Donna Manor, uh, Mr. Andrew Riddles, uh, from Gortnessy, uh, Amy Campbell, and from Cumber, uh, Nori and Muriel Fraser. Amy Caldwell, what did I say? Campbell. Campbell. Even when it was written in front of me. Sorry, Amy. It's written here in Falshui afterwards. Can't even read my own writing, huh? even though it is typed. We're all dying. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and whose load is heavy, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble hearted, and you will find rest for your souls. This is the Lord's table, the bread and the wine, the invitation to eat and to drink are his. Therefore, all who sincerely believe in Jesus and confess him as their saviour and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord, whatever branch of the church you're a member of, you are welcome at this table. And we invite you to join with us and to share with us in the joy of this celebration. We find the words of institution for the Lord's Supper in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, uh, where he writes this. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. However, he also reminds us in that same passage that a man ought to examine himself before he eats and drinks of the bread and the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so, as we meet around the table, we pause to reflect and to prepare ourselves and to thank God for his grace and his forgiveness in each of our lives. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's, let's pray together. Now, Father God, we come again to confess our unworthiness before you. In these moments, as we prepare to join in this celebration together, Lord, surely we grieve the sins that are all too evident to your omniscient searching case. Father, will you forgive us for the harm that we have done by our hasty and thoughtless words? How we have discouraged those we might have helped. How we have embittered those we might have cheered. How we have frustrated those that we might have brought joy to. And wounded those that we might have encouraged. Father, forgive us for our wayward minds and our tongues that are so often prone to, to gossip, to flattery, to subtle insincerities. Lord, you know all our thoughts when we should have filled our minds with things that are pure and true and lovely, we have allowed our minds to be clogged with rubbish. No, oh God, will you cleanse every unworthy thought? But our Father, this table reminds us that despite our sins, despite our shortcomings, you still love us. We praise you that your son showed the full extent of his love, choosing the role of a servant and climbing that hill of sacrifice for us. Surely our finite minds 
couldn't even begin to grasp the breadth, the length, the height and the depth of your love for us. But here, before this table of your grace, we declare that through him we have received life and freedom from sin. Through him we have access to your presence. Through him we are adopted into your family, joined heirs with him of all the riches of your grace. And so will you accept our grateful thanks this day as we gather around this table and as we hear that gracious invitation of Jesus to come to him. Father, we pray that we would respond willingly to that call. So now we pray that these common elements of bread and wine would become the communion of his body broken and his blood that was shed for our salvation. And may we know that those arms that were once spread wide in sacrifice are now extended towards us in love and in welcome. And we pray in the name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus himself. Amen. Friends, draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, and his blood which was shed for you, and feed on him in your hearts with faith, by faith with thanksgiving. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and wine and gave thanks. And therefore, according to the institution, the example, and the command of our Lord, and as a memorial of him, we do likewise. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Folks, as is our custom, um, can I ask you as you receive uh, the bread and then afterwards the wine to, to wait uh, and we will uh, enjoy the meal together. We will eat and then drink uh, together.
Take eat, this is the body of Christ which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. The same way he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me.
This is the cup of the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of him. Let's just pray uh, as we close. Let's, let's pray. Father, what an amazing, amazing privilege this has been for us. To come around your table, to join together with each other and with you. To remember and to celebrate. To remember and to celebrate your amazing grace to us and the sacrifice of your son for us. To join together and have seen and tasted your goodness and grace in these representations we have shared together in this gracious meal today. And Father, as we rise from this table here today, will you help us to remember and to celebrate your grace each and every day? Will you come and fill us with your spirit and empower us to shine with that wonderful grace that we enjoy? out into the world around us. Will you conform us more and more into the image of Jesus and help us by your Spirit to follow you closely, to serve you faithfully, to worship you humbly, to proclaim your Lordship, your love and your grace in every aspect of our lives day by day. For we ask it in the precious name of your Son and our Saviour Jesus. And we unite together as we say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to close singing the last three verses of our communion hymn uh, together now. If you want to stand, and we'll sing it uh, together. <coughs> thank you once again for this time of worship, this time of fellowship, this time of union with you, Lord. We thank you 
for the celebration of both these sacraments together, and we pray that you would part us with your blessing. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with each of us, both now and forevermore. Amen.